Good afternoon. Um, I'm uh, Dr. Padma Gunratna, President, Sri Lanka Medical Association, for uh, the, those who have joined online. Uh, let me warmly welcome uh, all of you who have gathered here, as well as that uh, many of you who have joined online for the uh, clinical meeting, the webinar uh, that is organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association, along with Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine on COVID-19 hospital management essentials. You know that this is the most important and most relevant, uh, most timely topic for all doctors as well as, uh, I mean, to even to citizens and even to media and anyone living uh, here in this country, because that we are in a, a, a sort of a very uh, serious and critical state with uh, very rapidly uh, escalating the caseload of the COVID-19 patients. Therefore, it's so important for all doctors, doctors at all levels of care, doctors at all levels of hospitals to be familiar with the in-hospital management of COVID patients, uh, the in-hospital home management as the mild cases as well as the severe cases because uh, when uh, a patient presents to you, uh, it would not be possible for us to say that uh, this specialist and that, and that uh, I'm not familiar because the cases are going to be so common. So based uh, with that impression that we have lined up three eminent speakers, actually I need to be very thankful to our SLMA coordinator for this clinical meetings, Dr. Achala Balasurya, for uh, liaising with the uh, uh, College of Internal Medicine. And we have been able to line up three eminent speakers who are with first-hand experience on giving care for these patients. However, the uh, first speaker to address this topic would be uh, Dr. Harsha Satish Chandra. Uh, he's the consultant physician uh, at the National Hospital Sri Lanka. He would be talking to us evidence-based therapeutics in COVID-19. So uh, uh, before that, let me invite all speakers to podium. The other speakers are Dr. Ha uh, Satish Chandra, as I invited, and then uh, Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikram will be here at any moment, as well as Dr. Akla Sadikin, consultant chest physician from the uh, MRI. Uh, so uh, let me invite Dr. Harsha Satish Chandra to commence the, uh, his presentation. Thank you, Madam President, for giving me the opportunity to speak on this topic. and. Uh, we are happy uh, to organize this along with SLMA as the President of the College of Internal Medicine. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Padma Bhunaratna for giving us this opportunity. Uh, now, to set the tone for the discussion, I would like to uh, uh, go through with you uh, uh, the topic of evidence-based therapeutics in COVID-19. Now, there has been an evolution of treatment over the past uh, year and a half uh, since the pandemic uh, broke in uh, uh, December, late December 2019. And uh, I think uh, you may recall that uh, uh, it was on the 10th of January that China released the genomic sequence of the SARS coronavirus 2. And since then, uh, the scientific committee has been busy uh, trying to work on uh, therapeutic and vaccine targets. And uh, they have tried out several, several uh, treatments. And uh, to comment on antivirals, I think several antivirals were already uh, being used for different conditions. And they, they were trialed out on the basis that there had been in vitro evidence of efficacy. Uh, now, uh, an example would be uh, 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 remdesivir, and then also uh, uh, the uh, anti-HIV drugs, uh, uh, retinovir, and then uh, lipanovir, uh, and some other other uh, favipiravir. So a few drugs that were tried out, uh, but actually, uh, overall the results results were disappointing. And some other drugs which had which were not exactly antivirals, but which were which had uh, antiviral properties, were also tri tried out in trials. Uh, based on their in vitro efficacy 
uh, against SARS coronavirus 2. Then uh, drug repositioning was also attempted, even drugs like famotidine were tried out. So uh, there was a wide range of drugs that were tried out. In general, uh, the trials in the initial stages were a little disorganized. And actually at one point, the National Institute of Health in the US came out with a statement that uh, there was a bit of chaos with uh, regard to the organization of trials. And that's why we had to wait for quite a while to get proper evidence for our treatments. Now, before I go on to uh, describing the treatments, I think it just, uh, it would be uh, nice to sort of go through the uh, complications that COVID-19 could uh, cause. Now, it's essentially a severe pneumonia, but we do know that uh, lots of complications uh, are, are possible and the drug targets, the therapeutic targets are aimed at those as well. So uh, one particular issue is ARDS, which needs prolonged uh, mechanical ventilation. And I, I think uh, the, the issue here is that un, there was a study which showed that unlike patients with severe influenza, uh, patients with uh, uh, coronavirus 2, with COVID-19, had, had a longer need for ventilation. They ended up being, in, uh, being ventilated for two weeks, even, even more than that which was causing a severe strain on the systems. And then there was uh, direct virus induced uh, organ injury as well. Actually, uh, the virus has been captured even in the myocardium. So there is direct injury which causes myocarditis, uh, then acute kidney injury. And then of course, this uh, much described uh, cytokine storm, which is, uh, I mean, it's not there in each and every patient, it's there in some patients. And when it is there, it, it causes lots of issues. And of course, a, another new thing that we have concentrated on is the possibility of thrombotic complications. Acute MI, acute stroke, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism. And uh, of course, there's a recent interest on CVST, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. It is said that COVID-19, uh, the incidence of uh, uh, CVST in COVID-19 is as high as 40 per million. Now we were talking about a CVST rate of 5 per million with vaccines, but COVID-19 itself can cause a CVST uh, rate of uh, 40 per million. So which is a, which is a significant uh, uh, issue. And then of course, because these patients are in ICUs for long and they are being treated, they, they have uh, secondary bacterial and fungal sepsis, and which is another topic in itself. So the main point I want to highlight is that uh, no two COVID-19 patients are alike. They, they, they are heterogeneous, their needs are different. So the challenge is to identify those specific needs and uh, aim the therapeutic targets at those. So strategies of management would be broadly uh, innovative oxygenation and ventilatory strategies. I think I'm sure Dr. Afla would uh, elaborate on that uh, shortly. And then antivirals targeting specific therapeutic windows, which is also important. It's not just at any point in the disease, but in, in a specific window. And then of course, the immunosuppressive agents to counter the cytokine storm, anticoagulants to prevent and treat thrombosis, and convalescent plasma and uh, synthetically derived monoclonal antibodies are two forms of treatment, which when given early uh, are postulated to reduce the risk of uh, progression to severe disease. And there's new interest in this, although they're expensive treatments, they, they, they do have a place. And of course, appropriate antibiotics and antifungals and antiplatelet drugs when indicated. And overall, and, and more, uh, most importantly, the general supportive care in the HDU and the IC. Now, IV remdesivir is one of the drugs that are widely, that's widely used, uh, but let's examine the evidence base for that. Of course, in vitro efficacy was there and it was used in the Ebola epidemic with some success, uh, but multiple trials showed different, uh, different degrees of uh, different results. And uh, it is uh, mostly used in hospitalized hypoxic patients. Uh, uh, so when they become hypoxic, a dose of 200 milligrams IV is given on day one, which is followed by 100 milligram daily for up to four to nine days. Some regimens recommend a five day course. 
some recommend a 10 day course. It's very expensive. A five day course would cost something like rupees uh, 50,000, Sri Lankan rupees 50,000. So that's quite expensive. And that's also the, uh, also they're actually not, uh, uh, they are generics uh, uh, made in India. And uh, the other issue with Remdesivir is that it was mostly used in patients with CBDs because in the West where the drug was tried out, patients presented late. So they were hypoxic by the time they got to hospital. So the use was a bit late later on in the disease. So maybe there, I mean, studies should have been done uh, with remdesivir early on in disease in order to see that that would have caused uh, uh, less, uh, less progression of this illness. So widely US, used in the US, uh, that was basically based on this trial conducted by the National Institute of Health. It's called ACTT1. And uh, broadly what it showed was that it shortened the, the, survive, uh, the duration of hospital stay by about four to five days. Now the end point was duration of hospital stay, which is a little odd. I mean, it was not a mortality benefit uh, trial. So that's, that's, uh, that's one criticism of the trial. Uh, so to elaborate a bit on this, so that's the trial. Uh, I think you may not be able to see this, but they had given remdesivir to about uh, 600 patients and uh, standard of care to another 600 patients in the trial. And the primary endpoint, as I said, was the duration of hospital stay. And these graphs, I, I'm not sure whether you can make out the details, but broadly what it shows remdesivir is in blue and uh, the placebo is in red. So what it shows is that, uh, and x-axis is number of days, y-axis uh, the proportion uh, recovered. So uh, remdesivir on a given day, there is more recovery with remdesivir and conversely, if you take a percentage of uh, recovery, uh, that is uh, earlier with the remdesivir than placebo. So uh, the, they studied various subgroups, uh, people who were on oxygen, people who were on uh, NIV, then on mechanical ventilation. So uh, overall, uh, it was seen that there was about four to five days of uh, less hospital stay with uh, remdesivir. Um, and, uh, if you take the subgroups, generally that benefit seemed to be there in various racial groups as well. But as you come down in the slide, I don't think you can make it out well. Uh, in the groups where, they, where the patient was given uh, NIV and mechanical ventilation, the benefits seemed to be a little less. So their conclusion was this. Our data show that remdesivir is superior to placebo in shortening the time to recovery in adults who were hospitalized with COVID-19 had had evidence of a lower respiratory tract infection. So, I mean, it was just a trial that showed that hospital, uh, hospital uh, stay was lessened. And mind you, remdesivir has uh, serious liver side effects. So that's one other issue that we have to take into account when we, if we do recommend. Then very soon after that trial, the WHO, which conducted the solidarity trial, which, is, which was a trial designed uh, to test various uh, treatments, including hydroxychloroquine, the antivirals, and remdesivir was also one of those. And in this trial, they actually gave remdesivir to about uh, 2,500 patients. So it was a larger, I mean, we had a larger study group and the endpoint was mortality. So, I mean, this is a, this is a direct mo mortality trial. And uh, if I just, go through the conclusion. Uh, I would not bore you with the details. The, what the conclusion was uh, that uh, remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir and interferon regimens had little or no effect on hospitalized patients with COVID-19 as indicated by overall mortality, initiation of ventilation and duration of hospital stay. So this, this even contra contradicts the uh, the US trial uh, by saying that even the hospital stay was not listened. So, I mean, that was, uh, that was quite a uh, surprising finding. Uh, but remember, it was a larger trial. So WHO based on this recommends against the use of IV remdesivir in COVID-19 patients. So, but it is still widely used in the US. I think it's used quite a lot in India as well. 
but there is no hard evidence base for that. Now I come to the most important thing about uh, COVID-19 treatment that is steroids. Now, even before the trials were designed, I think lots of clinicians used IV steroids, uh, dexamethasone, dexamethasone, hydrocortisone, and, and a lot others uh, in patients with severe COVID-19 on the basis that there was severe inflammation, which we had to counter. Uh, but the, the proper trial that really showed us benefit was the recovery trial, uh, which was done in Oxford, UK, which showed that the simple, cheap and widely available drug dexamethasone given six milligrams intravenously or orally over a period of 10 days to patients needing oxygen had statistically significant mortality benefit. And uh, this has led to the wide adoption of steroid as the mainstay of treatment in COVID-19, in severe COVID-19 patients. Uh, so I think it's worth examining this trial a little bit more so here, dexamethasone was given to a large group of patients, uh, I think close to about 4,000. And uh, then they, again, the primary outcome was mortality at 28 days. And uh, so they have, if we look at the plot, uh, the first shows uh, all participants in all groups of patients. And it shows definitely that using dexamethasone reduced the mortality at 28 days and the mortality benefit lasted. I mean, it was from seven to four, 28 days, it was quite consistent. And then patients with invasive mechanical ventilation, again, it showed clear benefit. Uh, and in patients who are just on oxygen also, there, there was a uh, benefit. In the overall group, the p-value was 0 0.001, so which is very, very significant. But in patients who did not require oxygen, uh, actually, the p-value was, was not significant. Actually, the trial went on to say that it may have even had an adverse effect because uh, dexamethasone, if given early, can cause blunting of the immune response. So that immune response we do need in uh, COVID-19 patients. So uh, using dexamethasone early to suppress the virus actually was, was uh, uh, counterproductive. So their conclusion was that in patients hospitalized with COVID-19, the use of dexamethasone resulted in lower 28-day mortality among those who were receiving either invasive mechanical ventilation or oxygen alone at randomization, but not among those receiving no respiratory support. So it was for patients who turned hypoxic and who required oxygen for treatment. Getting on to convalescent plasma, now that is the use of plasma for patients who have recovered from COVID-19, generally plasma is taken after one month of uh, recovery. And uh, the aim is to have plasma which has a high ant antibody, antibody teeter. So this form of treatment has been tried out in various uh, infections in the past, SARS, MERS, influenza epidemics, and Ebola. So the basic uh, uh, rationale behind this is to uh, use the neutralizing antibody in convalescent plasma to counter the virus until the specific immune response in the infected person gets established. So uh, we have to give it early and we have to get plasma that has a high antibody cheater. So that's a challenging task. And uh, USFDA has given an emergency use authorization for this. There are lots of trials. Uh, now, just to quote one or two, uh, this is an RCT that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine on the use of uh, convalescent plasma in severe COVID pneumonia. Uh, the patients were enrolled uh, at a median of eight days, so that was pretty late. Uh, I think the issue was, the was that the patients were in hospital quite late and uh, mild to moderately symptomatic patients were not treated at hospitals. So uh, 228 patients in, in the uh, convalescent plasma arm and only about 105 in the placebo arms. The antibody teeter was quite high, one in 3,200. And the primary outcome was clinical status at 30 days. So that did not show any mortality benefit. And the conclusion was that there was no significant difference between convalescent plasma and placebo. 
but as I said earlier, it was uh, given rather late in the, in the illness. And there's an Indian trial uh, named Placid, which was published in the BMJ, uh, where they compared uh, convalescent plasma with standard care. And uh, convalescent plasma, two doses were given 24 hours apart. And the main outcome assessed was mortality at uh, 28 days. And that also concluded that there was no difference between the two groups. Uh, some other trials showed conflicting results, but there was no large trial that showed clear benefit. The only good thing with convalescent plasma is that it's, it's relatively safe. Only about 1% of adverse events. I think we have tried that out in Sri Lanka as well. So, uh, but the evidence base again is not strong. Then monoclonal antibodies in COVID-19, this uses the same principle, but these are synthetically derived monoclonal an antibodies. And they are given as an infusion early on in the disease, as an, actually the patients are outpatients and the infusion is given and then they are sent home. So the idea is to give the antibody early on. So uh, this is for patients who have a high risk of severe COVID-19 due to their comorbidities and uh, several drugs have been licensed by the, by the FDA. Uh, the drug uh, Bemlenivimab, uh, which is directed against the spike protein. And then you may recall uh, the former US President Donald Trump was given uh, Regeneron, Regeneron coronavirus uh, COV2, uh, which is a combination of uh, Casirivimab and Imdivimab. And uh, so it's supposed to reduce viral loads and prevent progression of disease. So it's actually sound treatment and it works as well, but no large trial data is available, but extremely expensive. So I think it's beyond our, our capabilities to have these drugs. And, uh, uh, but they do have a role. Now, there has been much recent interest in anti-inflammatory therapies, and especially on this uh, interleukin-6 uh, blocker tocilizumab, uh, which uh, counters the macrophage activation syndrome and the cytokine storm. Uh, there were several papers published. Uh, there was one uh, in the NEGM in early January, which showed benefit in a subgroup. It was a, it was a small trial. And then I'll, I'll refer to that in a minute. And then there was the study, uh, remap cap, uh, which was published in the NEJM uh, that showed that uh, both tocilizumab and serilumab, both are interleukin-6 inhibitors, were beneficial in the critically ill if given early on uh, when they require respiratory support or cardiovascular organ support. So it's, it's not very late in their disease. It's fairly early on in the disease and they, are, they showed Im improvement in uh, survival. And several other drugs are also used. Uh, there's one interesting drug, uh, the, uh, uh, the Janus kinase inhibitor, boricitinib, boricitinib, which is an oral drug, but that has to be combined with IV remdesivir. These are used in the US only. I don't think it's, they are used in other, other countries. And these are on top of IV dexamethasone. I must stress that. So it's not a substitute for IV dexamethasone. So this is the trial that uh, I was referring to earlier in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 pneumonia who were not receiving mechanical ventilation. Tocilizumab reduced the likelihood of progression to the composite outcome of mechanical ventilation or death. Then we get on to this important trial again, the recovery group, which came up with the evidence for dexamethasone uh, in a preprint that was uh, uh, published about two months ago. The, it has not been published in a journal yet. Uh, they had tested tocilizumab in their recovery trial arm. And uh, uh, those with hypoxia, oxygen saturation less than 92% on air or requiring oxygen therapy, and evidence of systemic inflammation uh, as gauged by a CRP value of over 75 milligrams per liter were randomized to usual standard of care alone or usual standard of care plus tocilizumab at a dose of 400 milligram to 800 milligram, depending on, on, on the weight of the patient, given IV. A second dose could be given 12 to 24 hours later if the patient had not improved. Again, all these patients were on IV dexamethasone. So around 2000 patients were in each, each arm and the primary endpoint was 28 day mortality. 
patients allocated to tocilizumab were more likely to be discharged from hospital alive within 28 days. Uh, the p-value was uh, 0 0.001, so that's quite uh, significant. And uh, among those not on invasive mechanical ventilation at baseline, patients allocated tocilizumab were less likely to reach the composite endpoint of invasive mechanical ventilation or death. So quite promising results. Um, and so their interpretation was that in hospitalized COVID-19 patients with hypoxia and systemic inflammation, tocilizumab improved survival and other clinical outcomes. Uh, these benefits were seen regardless of the level of respiratory support and were additional to the benefit of steroids. So these, all these patients were on dexamethasone and over and above that, they were given tocilizumab and the benefit was also shown over and above that of dexamethasone. So the exact therapeutic window is, is deciding on that is the challenge here. And it has to be carefully chosen. Uh, now tocilizumab cannot be given in patients with impending or established bacterial sepsis. So we may have to uh, decide on that by doing other tests uh, to exclude bacterial sepsis. Um, and uh, uh, the systemic inflammation is gauged by the CRP level. There may be other parameters like, uh, uh, like serum ferritin, which will also be useful in these patients. Um, and procalcitonin. Uh, so it's not a, a case for treating all patients with tocilizumab, but in selected patients only. And that has to be done very carefully by the clinicians. So anticoagulation in COVID-19, everyone agrees that because COVID-19 leads to a pro-inflammatory state, thrombotic complications are common. So we have to be on the lookout for those, identify those early and treat. Uh, and actually in a case series in Italy, post-mortem series, out of 21 patients, uh, 15 had microthromba in the lung, but only about four or five had actual pulmonary embolism. So microthromba were much commoner. And uh, so uh, the uh, patients who turn hypoxic in our hospitals, it is recommended to start at least on a preventive dose of enoxaparin, 40 milligram subcut and reduce to 30 milligrams in patients with renal impairment. And um, of course, in uh, patients with uh, end-stage renal failure and dialyzed patients, unfractionated heparin has to be used. Now, there is a little bit of controversy. There are some guidelines which say that the initial treatment when they turn hypoxic should be a treatment dose, of, dose for VTE but that is uh, not accepted by everyone. So I think we haven't heard the last about this. So it's uh, still studies are evolving, but people agree that at least the preventive dose has to be started in these patients uh, to prevent complication. So the local guideline in Sri Lanka still adopts this policy of starting on the preventive dose and uh, going up on, on to the treatment dose if there's clinical suspicion, even if there's clinical suspicion of, v, of VTE, that is warranted, or else if the D-dime is high or the TEG shows that there is, a, uh, there is a VTE. <clears throat> and the other controversial issue is when these patients are discharged, are we to have them on anticoagulation or not? Again, there is no general recommendation. So it, is, it should be on a case by case basis. Another interesting topic is antiplatelet agents in COVID-19. Dipyridamol, aspirin have been studied and it's postulated that the thrombotic complications could be reduced. And there was a retrospective site, not a RCT retrospective study uh, done in the University of Maryland, published in uh, the journal Anesthesia and Analgesia, which compared 98 patients who were on aspirin one week before hospital admission or started on aspirin within 24 hours of, ad of admission and 314 patients who were not on aspirin. So the results showed that the aspirin arm, in the aspirin arm, patients were 43% less likely to need ICU care and 44% less likely to need invasive mechanical ventilation and 47 less likely to be like to die in hospital. Remember, this was, uh, this was not a RCT. So the practice, it, it has not been adopted as, as a practice. Um, and uh, there were some other studies one from China, especially, which said that there was no benefit. Uh, so I, again, I think the jury is out there. We, we don't quite know. 
but patients who are on aspirin for cardiovascular illness should be continued on aspirin. And that's, the, that's what the local guideline also says currently. Uh, there has been some recent in, interest on ivermectin in COVID-19. And actually the in vitro efficacy of ivermectin is much more than that of hydroxychloroquine. So for some reason, the trials have started late and uh, uh, most of them have been observation studies. Some small RCTs are there. And there was one observation study in, in US from Florida and which was published in the journal Chest. And um, it showed that there was a mortality benefit with ivermectin, but in that arm, apparently higher use of steroids was seen. So that was a confounding variable, so they couldn't actually decide on it. Small RCTs have shown various uh, results. Now, previously, US FDA said that they recommended against the use of ivermectin, but uh, from early this year, like they have changed that to the stance that they cannot either recommend for or against the use of ivermectin. So I think they are waiting for trials, but no guideline in any, any country, as, I, as far as I know, uh, gives ivermectin uh, for these patients. So just to outline the, what we do here in Sri Lanka, I think Anand will elaborate on this. So asymptomatic and mild to moderate, mild to, moderate to symptomatic COVID-19 patients uh, diagnosed by diagnosed the PCR or validated rapid antigen test are isolated in intermediate care centers or hospitals and monitored for disease progression. So low dose aspirin is continued in adults with high cardiovascular risk and patients with uh, COVID-19 and those with comorbidities are, are sent from intermediate centers to higher centers and also to specialized COVID hospitals. And when the patient becomes hypoxic with a uh, oxygen saturation of 94 or less on room air, the extermethasone is started immediately and continued uh, for 10 days. And treatment for uh, VTE is also given and uh, uh, the patient, of course, if the oxygen needs are high, and I think Afla will elaborate on this, the patient may need transit to HDU and ICU. Uh, so various oxygen strategies will be adopted, which will be dealt with by Afla and uh, uh, antimicrobial therapy when appropriate and uh, invasive mechanical ventilation should be started uh, early if indicated, it should not be delayed. So again, the emphasis on supportive care in the ICUs. Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, Dr. Harsh Satish Chandra. Dr. Harsh Satish Chandra is the president of the uh, Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine, and we are fortunate that we had him as a speaker here. Our next speaker would be, um, uh, uh, would be addressing outpatient and ward management of COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Anand, would you yeah. uh, So I think that uh, uh, um, we have uh, been able to have the, uh, the most uh, eligible clinician that who have uh, been taking care of uh, majority of uh, these patients from the beginning. Uh, he's Dr. Anand David Krama, he's the consultant physician of the um, IDH, the Infectious Disease of the uh, Hospital. This is Hospital. Uh, Dr. Anand David Krama. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Madam, uh, for giving me this opportunity. And I would like to thank the uh, SLM and the College of Internal Medicine for organizing this uh, important and very current uh, uh, discussion on this. Uh, I'm planning to briefly discuss about the outpatient and in mode management. And uh, this is one of the common problems we encounter as doctors. One of our team members has got very COVID. A doctor in your team has got fever for two days with body aches, no other symptoms, has had the first dose of COVID vaccine, as uh, most of us would have. And uh, this sort of scenarios we encounter in the real life quite often. So we have to think of the possible COVID in the prevailing uh, circumstances. And also at the same time, we have to think of other febrile illnesses, especially in some areas in Colombo. Now the dengue is again being reported 
and uh, with increasing numbers. And then in some areas, we see leptospirosis and of course, uh, other viral illnesses too. So what would you do? So what to advise we have to give such a patient? First, of course, because we have to suspect COVID, we have to isolate the patient and take measures on infection prevention and control measures, paracetamol more or less so is. And uh, it is important to do when we suspect COVID, uh, the COVID PCR, and also because of other possibilities there, uh, it's uh, good to do a full blood count and, and a CRP at least. And then uh, he strongly thinks it is COVID and asks whether to take dexamethasone, ivermectin, HCQ, vitamin D, uh, vitamin C, uh, vitamin E. Uh, so this has addressed some of the things we will discuss in due course about the about the need of taking this. Um, in fact, recently one of my friends, uh, a fellow consultant came with this sort of scenario. And by the time she, go, she was diagnosed as uh, uh, COVID, she also already had dexamethasone and ivermectin. I don't know from where she got ivermectin. Uh, so this uh, particular doctor I was referring to, actually came to me with the full blood count, with the white count of 8,000 in neutrophils of 70%. And, uh, and he had a positive dengue and IgG and IgM result. He had a fever of two days, coming with on third day. And uh, then he gave a history of attending a new year party. This was around 22nd of, uh, or 25th of April, a week before. And uh, one of the participants uh, was later diagnosed as having COVID. So we arrange a COVID PCR. And then for such patient, we have to tell, and it became positive. So he called me asking what to do now. So until he's admitted, we have to ask them to have all positive people to have physical rest, adequate hydration, paracetamol for fever or and body aches. And then they can have symptom other symptomatic treatment uh, using domperidone if they have cough, uh, salbutamol, MDI, or maybe Montelukast. Uh, and of course, it is important to have self-monitoring. There's no place so dexamethasone, ivermectin, HCQ, uh, vitamin D, vitamin E, or vitamin C. It is important to have self-monitoring until they get admitted, because it's important to monitor as some patients with initial mild clinical presentation may get worse towards the second week of illness. Generally, we see complications around from seven to 10 days from the onset of symptoms, generally. Occasionally, we see late, but most of the time it occurs during that period. However, the whether we can monitor these patients as inpatients or outpatients has to be made on, on a case-by-case -case basis. As uh, Satish mentioned, at the moment, uh, we admit all the positive patients, but of course, there can be delays in admitting these patients uh, due to various reasons. So in such situations, it is important to monitor these patients and give advice on such situations. And uh, the decision to monitor will, uh, or, or whether they can monitor at home will depend not only on clinical presentation, but also on other many other things, including the patient's ability to engage in self-monitoring, the feasibility of safe isolation at home, and the risk of transmission in the patient's home environment. Uh, and then there are many other things like living alone and so are the other problems. If they are at home until admission, it's good if they can use a separate bathroom and a separate room. If it is not feasible, they should take care uh, to disinfect the bathroom after each use, otherwise it can uh, spread to other people in the, uh, uh, in the home. Then the patient and other household members are capable of should be capable of adhering to precautions recommended as part of the home care or isolation, which means the, the usual infection prevention control practices, including proper wearing of a face mask. It may be easy to uh, advise a medical person, but when it is a non-medical person until admission, we have to strictly advise him to stay at home and not to leave home except to get medical care. 
and especially not to use public areas. And then they have to make sure that they get rest and get uh, hydrated and to take paracetamol if necessary. Uh, and uh, if they, in case, if they have any trouble in breathing or if they think if they, they have any trouble in breathing, we'll discuss about the warning signs later and they have to consider, they have to contact emergency services. And to come to hospital, they should avoid public transport or, or sharing uh, like the other people and taxis. And of course, in, you know, we can call uh, 1990 or uh, which provides a quite effective service uh, in our country. And in addition, they have to inform their uh, his or her close contacts that they may have been exposed to COVID-19 uh, from the onset of symptoms within the previous 48 hours, he can spread the, he or she can spread the illness to others. And therefore it is important to inform the, the close contacts so that they can uh, be cautious. Then it's important to educate them on warning signs. If they have any trouble in breathing, uh, if they have features suggestive of hypoxia, like difficult, uh, again, uh, difficult in breathing, blue uh, lips and so on, which is of course are late signs of hypoxia. But if they have pressure on chest, new confusion, inability to wake or stay awake, uh, of course, these are actually uh, some of the, some signs are, symptoms are of course late symptoms and signs of hypoxia. Uh, on the other hand, if they have repeated vomiting, some people can have persistent diarrhea, uh, they need to get admitted. It is important, as we all know, the hypoxia is the issue in, uh, in uh, COVID in most of the patients. So we can tell the patient, they feel this sneak with mild exertion, feeling this sneak with talking. Sometimes a friend might notice during a telephone conversation. Uh, and they, they can educate some people about one breath count. And if the cough is worsening, if they're persistently feeling unwell, inability to tolerate liquids, persistent fever, they have to uh, seek for immediate medical attention. And then we have to admit pa these patients. And at the pa moment, we try to admit all the patients uh, for two reasons. One thing is for isolation, and secondly, for monitoring for the development of severe disease, which only some patients uh, develop, go into that uh, category. Um, so once admitted, we have to monitor vital parameters like the blood pressure, pulse, the respiratory rate, then the pulse oximetry is very important. And of course, it's important to fluid in, uh, monitor the fluid intake and output also because some of the, some of the patient, the out intake can be poor. Uh, generally, it's good to do a full blood count and a CRP because it can be something else too. Whether to do a chest X-ray or not is depend, will depend on the patient. Even with patients with mildly symptomatic patients, we have seen X-ray changes. If we do an X-ray, therefore it is not essential to do an X-ray. In fact, if we do a CT scan, you can detect these changes quite early. And that had been used as a diagnostic tool in, in China uh, at some point. Uh, but those are not necessary unless uh, it is uh, essential. But of course, if their symptoms are getting worse, uh, if the cough is getting worse, if they are becoming this sneak, then I think it is important to have a chest X-ray. Then depending on the patient, we have to decide uh, whether to do serum ferritin, LDH, LFT, D-dimer, procalcitonin, and so on. Uh, not in everybody, definitely. Then there are other challenges when we admit these patients. We have to ensure the safety of healthcare workers. Now that is of paramount importance, which have been shown in, uh, in journals like Lancet too. Uh, but of course, that is uh, not that difficult because it, what is important is to make sure that we adhere to basic uh, infection prevention control measures like hand washing, practicing cough etiquettes, avoid unnecessary gatherings, maintain physical distancing, minimize touching surfaces, disinfecting surfaces, face masks, wearing properly, and wearing use of PPs appropriately and correctly. Um, so if they are getting close to the patient or attending to a patient, we advise them to have we have full PP kit, which is available in, in hospital. Uh, that is when they, they are having uh, close encounters with patients like uh, blood drawing. On the other hand, these uh, 
infection control measures should not prevent we from doing necessary um, management or interventions to these patients. This patient had a large pleural effusion. Uh, here you can see we were with uh, all the PEP, we were aspirating the pleural effusion with this patient. You can see uh, the bottle is getting filled more, more than half a year, a large, quite large pleural effusion. Uh, as I said earlier, the, the most important thing is to monitor the pulse oximeter, uh, the oxygen saturation, for which we can use uh, exertion oximetry. That is to see whether they become desaturated with uh, mild exertion. That can be used as an early identification uh, in pay of patients who are uh, likely to get uh, hypoxia or, or significant hypoxia. And then we can select that group and monitor more closely. Uh, it is important to identify because patients do not often realize that they are becoming hypoxic. They have symptoms, they, they don't uh, drop down suddenly uh, without any symptom. They have symptoms, they have fever or cough and body aches, they have all those symptoms, but the issue is they don't understand the hypoxia. I think that is what we have to stress upon as uh, doctors. Uh, now there's a sort of myth going around, uh, even without any symptom, they can drop down due to uh, issues. I, I don't believe in that. Uh, what we see is the patients come late to hospitals because they have common symptoms of flu, which they ignore or which they take uh, treatment from a general practitioner. But since they don't have symptoms till late, symptoms of hypoxia till late, they don't come to the hospital. A uh, couple of weeks ago, uh, I got a call from a consultant about a patient. Uh, the cons what the consultant said was, even when he was the patient was talking over the phone, he was breathless. So I said, then asked the patient to get admitted immediately. So when the patient came, he was very hypoxic. That's he had symptoms for six days at home, uh, and uh, but he didn't probably realize uh, he was hypoxic. And we had to straight away take him to the ICU. Later, he was intubated and ventilated, but within uh, two days, he succumbed. So that happens in the, when the presentations are late. Uh, in the hospital, we easily, we, what the things we use, can, uh, the recommended things are the four step walk and one, or, or one minute sit to stand. Uh, and then, so what we do is we have to, we check the saturation first and then ask the patient to walk for 40 step or, or sit down, sit and stand up for one minute and then recheck the saturation. And then if it is going down, then that patient is more prone to uh, develop hypoxia uh, in the near, near future. So such patients we need to monitor carefully. If we take a patient who was admitted some time ago, uh, this uh, lady, 48 year lady, was admitted with a fever and with fever and cough for five days. She had other features suggesting of uh, COVID, like anosmia. Uh, she's a diabetic. On uh, admission, she was dyspneic with a respirator of 36 per minute. The saturation was uh, 93 percent on 15 liters of oxygen. He was tachycardic. Uh, ABG shows pH of 7.3, and uh, by and the carbon dioxide was quite high. And uh, the investigation showed the uh, white count. You can see the white count was going down towards the latter part of the illness. And uh, neutrophil counts remained high, which is uh, which we generally see in these patients. Uh, and also the platelet counts tend to go up in some patients. This again, uh, probably a common finding and CRP also high uh, because COVID causes a severe inflammatory reaction. Uh, it's not, an, not due to the bacterial infection, but COVID per se can cause uh, quite a high CRP due to severe immune reaction. That's why Hutch uh, said that uh, uh, if it is high, that is taken as an indication or considered as an indication to give uh, tocilizumab. Um, this was the chest X-ray initially. And uh, you can see bilateral shadows. Oh, she was treated with the dexamethasone, IV ceftriaxone, oral clarithromycin, and uh, enoxaparin. And then later, we added uh, fluconazole. And 
So she continued to, oh, we continued on oxygen with initially with country breathing face mask. And uh, then the saturation went down and the, the got worse gradually, but then later it improved. So she, she finally recovered and went. Um, so the challenge is we have very limited options as treatments, as uh, many things were mentioned by uh, Satis. Uh, the WHO therapeutic and COVID-19 guidelines gives uh, 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 evidence-based guidance on this. And uh, in some of these, uh, I was privileged to be part of the, the guideline committee. And um, this, uh, the, the changing guideline, this, uh, they call it the living guideline and the recommendation on uh, uh, steroids was mainly based on uh, recovery trial. The evidence came from recovery trial, which is a quite a large study uh, as uh, the, the, that was mentioned by uh, Satis. And um, however, the one thing I would like to point out here is in spite of seeing a good uh, benefit of dexamethasone, even in the dexamethasone group, there was a death rate of 22.9%. So that showed that the, the population they took had a quite a high mortal rate. The difference was significant, but still even in among patients who had dexamethasone, there was a quite a high mortal rate. Uh, so they did subgroup analysis. There, there, there was a suggestion whether the early initiation of uh, uh, therapy could uh, be better. Uh, however, the meta-analysis did not support that hypothesis. Uh, some of the members during the discussion came up with the idea that postponing systemic uh, steroids until viral replication is contained by the immune system may be reasonable. And uh, many noted it's difficult to ascertain the, the exact uh, the time of onset of symptoms in, in many cases. So therefore, the, finally, the panel decided uh, or concluded that giving the evidence, it was preferable on the side of administering corticosteroids when treating with severe uh, COVID-19, even if it, within seven days uh, of onset of symptoms. And of course, it was recommended not to use steroids in patients who are not hypoxic. Uh, today I was uh, listening to a, that was actually a training program where some resource organized by the WHO, uh, uh, one resource person, uh, an Indian national, he mentioned when he, we were discussing about dexamethasone, he said, in India, a lot of people use dexamethasone at present, a lot of COVID patients, even without hypoxia, are given dexamethasone, and some speculate that the increased death rate Maybe, but at least some of that could be attributed to unnecessary use of dexamethasone. Um, so we start oxygen and the saturation is uh, less than 94. And then in addition, uh, uh, Dr. Afla will uh, elaborate on the oxygen treatment. In addition, we give anoxiparin, dexamethasone, which can be given IV or oral. And it's important for them to have bed rest. And then the positioning, including self-proning, is very important to the high to ventilate uh, the the non-ventilated areas of lung and, and improve the perfusion. And also the hydration is important. And uh, as a symptomatic, uh, this thing we use uh, bronch uh, bronchodilators for these patients. Uh, this is seen from our ICU. We were putting. Uh, uh, percutane, doing a percutane stracheostomy for a patient who are on long-term uh, ventilator. This 94-year-old uh, male was uh, transferred to us uh, uh, early January from a private hospital with cough and fever for four days, cough for five days, body aches. And when he came on air, his saturation was 92%, but then with oxygen, two liters, he improved to 96 to 98%. He was hemodynamically stable. Later, he became a bit confused, saturation maintained with uh, two liters of oxygen, and uh, his investigations uh, uh, were basically normal, and uh, except for his creatinine was a little higher. I can't see why I mentioned that. His creatinine was, and CRP was quite high, and his creatinine was uh, also high. We thought probably due to it related. The chest x showed patchy consolidation in all three zones of right lung and mid zonal and perihilar region in left lung. 
and intraoperatory desk COVID changes. This was his chest X-ray. This uh, repeat chest X-ray, and uh, because he was confused, we did uh, non-contrast CT scan. He had a dilated cerebral atrophy and small vessel disease. And uh, the HRCT of chest showed ground glass opacities with associated path patchy consolidation in both lungs. And uh, in addition, there were nodular opacities uh, with bone destruction in one in T12. We did not, uh, and bilateral pleural effusion. And our suspicion that it could be neoplastic. So in spite of all this, we continue with the oxygen and self-proning. IV kefraxone was given, added, uh, and uh, clarithromycin and oxyparin. And um, in spite of all these issues, and in spite of his age, he recovered and, and went home. So as uh, Satish mentioned at the beginning, this is a highly individualized uh, scenario. Uh, now, generally, we expect in a patient like this, all these problems that uh, the outcome will be very poor. But uh, well, we, were, we also thought so at the beginning. But he recovered and went home. Uh, Uh, the the guide, uh, as uh, such mentioned, the guideline, uh, WHO guidelines, uh, there's a conditional recommendation against using remdesivir for treatment of hospitalized patient in the WHO guideline. This was based on analyzing uh, all the available evidence, uh, even though it is uh, approved by the FDA for emergency use or with emergency use authorization. Uh, however, it further goes into say if administration of remdesivir is considered, it should be noted that its use is contraindicated with, with uh, elevated liver enzymes and renal dysfunction. And uh, to date, as uh, mentioned, it is available in only the IV form. The, the targeted, as uh, mentioned previously, there are many immune modulators targeted and uh, tested and are being tested. This is the recommendation from uh, John Hopkins. Uh, they say they recommend the use of uh, this class of agents therapy only for patients who are enrolled in a clinical trial. Oh. So this again includes uh, tocilizumab 2. In Sri Lanka, we have used tocilizumab in some selected cases. Uh, some have improved, some have died. Um, so again, it's very difficult to see a, see a response. We were going by the, the high CRP and things. Uh, so we need, uh, we need trial evidence to use this sort of things in, in a critically ill patient because as I pointed out uh, in this case of 94 year old gentleman, some people recover uh, without all this in spite of all the problems they have. Then the other treatment, uh, the vitamin D supplementation uh, is uh, not recommended as a prevention method uh, unless they have vitamin D deficiencies or as a treatment method. HCQ is not recommended. Lopinavir aritinavir is not recommended based on the findings of the recovery trial. HCQ is also as based on the, mainly based on the recovery trial evidence. And uh, then they have been, uh, use of uh, acetromycin, uh, again, which is not recommended. So in summary, we have limited treatment options. It is very important to detect the hypoxia uh, and the main mode of treatment is oxygen. Uh, and of course, because of this situation, the prevention is the most important measure to address this epidemic. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ananda. Thank you very much. Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikrama is the consultant physician of the National Infectious Disease of the Hospital. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Afla Sadikin is the consultant chest physician at the uh, Medical Research Institute, Buralle. He would be addressing to us strategies for oxygenation in severe COVID-19. Dr. Afla. Thank you very much for that kind word of introduction. And uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers, uh, SLMA and uh, College of Internal Medicine for giving me this opportunity. So, the topic uh, I'm not, I'm, uh, I've given is about oxygenation. I know all of y'all, it's the hot topic, uh, especially in India. And uh, we all scared and worried the same uh, uh, heat will come here uh, on oxygen. So I'm not going to make it uh, more uh, complicated. 
So to make it uh, simple, we, I need to emphasize when it comes to oxygenation, it does not the oxygen, we need a bit of ventilation also for the COVID lung. So uh, next 30 minutes or so, I'll be talking a little bit on hypoxemia and high oxygenation in COVID patient, uh, uh, patients. And what the targets I'm looking at, or we are looking at uh, when treating those uh, moderate to severe illness patients, and what modalities we are going to deliver this oxygen, and also uh, the importance and modalities of ventilatory support when to increase our oxygenation, all those uh, severely ill patients. And uh, what we hear, and uh, being chest physicians, what we come across is this refractory hypoxemic patients and uh, the patients who are struggling uh, with all the modalities what we have uh, are despite all that, uh, like uh, the previous speaker said, they have, with the, all the medications and the oxygenation, still they are struggling with hypoxemia and um, prolonged ventilation in some patients. So deliberately, I'm not going on uh, invasive mechanical ventilation, but uh, I'll be just uh, working out on the simple two facts of uh, uh, oxygenation with uh, non-invasive ventilation. So to understand a little bit on uh, hypoxemia in COVID-19, it is a little interesting because usually we see when the patient is hypoxic or when there's low oxygen, we see those patients becoming more distinct. But in this group of patients, some of those uh, uh, patients, there is a significant intrapulmonary shunting uh, altogether with edema and atelectasis, uh, also uh, contributed by um, uh, intravascular microthrombi and uh, loss of lung perfusion. And before development of dyspnea, these patients become hypoxic. And after that only they become dysnic with the reduction of lung compliance, increasing dead space and CO2 retention with the uh, other additional change of pneumonia like consolidation and lactases. Remember, so oxygen therapy will start not at the time of the dyspnea. So that is the most important thing here to understand. So here it's all about picking up the hypoxic state. Unfortunately, what we see this group of patients is the happy hypoxic phase. What do you mean by happy hypoxic? They, they, they don't have the sense of breathlessness or hypoxic features, but what happens here is they'll be talking to you, as uh, uh, Ananda sir said, uh, they'll be just talking, but they'll, they'll sound breathless or they, they are saturation. If this, check it, it's very low. So the reason uh, they say that uh, this extreme intrapulmonary shunting over those COVID uh, uh, pneumonic lesion area is the one which is really contributing. Probably there is a, a relative uh, little dyspnea because there is a persistence paired normal compliant lung tissue around that area. This is a, a hypothetical uh, uh, pathophysiological explanation. However, these patients are even at the saturation of 90, they are quite okay, they're well tolerated. That is the worrying part because we don't want them to be 90s and 80s when they come to you, we heard about uh, from the previous speaker. So in a situation like that, yes, what we have is the oxygen. It's a drug. I'm, I must say that uh, this situation, the current, uh, current situation has given us a lot of uh, insight about oxygen. But remember, most of us didn't know oxygen as a drug. And it is, though it is widely used therapeutic agent, it has specific biochemical and physiological action. And uh, you have to, uh, it has an effective dose. And basically it has to come with a prescription. Uh, I, I'm afraid to say when I was a junior doctor, I did not know much about this uh, specific prescription uh, giving for oxygen. So we just say, give oxygen two liters, put on the face mask, that kind of thing. No, it's a, a specific prescription. When we give, say, when we give antibiotic, we prescribe twice a day or thrice a day. How many days on before meals or after meals, we give all the specific instruction. So must this is a very good opportunity for all of us to remember this therapeutic agent has this uh, particular uh, prescription where we have to work out on. So this is why what we are going to see next in the next few minutes or so. So, and uh, to know a little bit of oxygen demand in our 
hypoxic patient in COVID, we know that most of these patients are mild asymptomatic or mild illness. But remember, some of those moderately ill patients, about 40%, uh, they, they are hypoxic, they need uh, oxygen. And also 50% of them having severe illness requiring uh, continuous oxygen therapy. And 5% of them will end up in the ICU. And obviously, uh, not only the oxygenation, also with the ventilator support. So when we say about, in the, when we take about the treatment centers, uh, we need to understand that like right now, what we, uh, what the, our treatment centers are uh, not as the uh, defined treatment centers in uh, by the WHO. However, we, we are going to see more and more severe and critical patients in our setup in the treatment centers. So there is a nice uh, document from the WHO published in, uh, recently in, uh, in April about the oxygen sources and distribution of COVID-19 treatment centers. I think uh, this uh, graph will tell, uh, according to the number of patients, how we are going to decide how much of oxygen we need for each treatment center. I think uh, for the um, administrators and the management will be looking at these things uh, in the for the near for the future uh, difficulty time and we all know that yes we heard the pathophysiology a little bit from dr satish chandra that uh, the uh, it's not about just the um, um, uh, on the lung yes it's involved uh, in many organs however we need to understand that increased morbidity and mortality is on mainly from the respiratory system as a single organ so this there are we are seeing more and more number of cases with more and more hypoxemia so in a poor resource setting or with a difficult, in a challenging uh, situation, the distribution of the oxygen in those setups is quite in, important. So it, I, I found this uh, uh, um, interesting article in Lancet in 2015, that is way before the COVID-19. They found that the, in, a, in the resource limited countries, there's lack of su sufficient oxygen supply, one quarter of the hospital, they say. So it, 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 you can understand how, insufficiently we are we are, some of the countries are running with oxygen so when the demand is high we have to be very careful how we are going to deliver this oxygen uh, in at the correct time correct people and without wasting so for that we need to understand what are the modalities of oxygen we have to deliver obviously we know about the oxygen cylinders so there are jumbos and there are uh, depending on the uh, volume i'm not going to go into detail so that is a common setup we see in the ward setup the oxygen concentrators it's something uh, we use in all those chronic hypoxic patients in a respiratory setup uh, but remember that we can deliver only up to uh, five liters of per minute so commonly uh, uh, we see uh, in the HDU and ICU setup in, uh, when there is a high demand of oxygen, we see a, a centralized pipe oxygen system with a, with a pressure. So, however, the real the the modality of the oxygen delivery depending and designed according to the local resources and the supporting infrastructure. So I'm not going to go into detail because each center will have their own limitations and according to that. Uh, I think we should work out our uh, um, patient's uh, oxygen demand. So when it comes for oxygen, we should clearly ask from ourselves, like we heard from the previous speakers, we can't just randomly give oxygen as a drug because we have to identify whom these, these patients are going to be given oxygen. So it is important to understand who are these moderate uh, illness people and severe illness people, not only just to give oxygen, also for us to understand for the next accelerating point. So anybody who's having symptoms and signs of COVID with uh, saturation less than 94 on rumor, and they are chest imaging, if you are lucky, you can have some related changes, but not multilobal changes. So we call it moderate. And the severe patients, irrespective of their um, um, uh, symptoms, uh, if their saturation is still less than 90, 90 on maximum oxygen supplement, or they are room air, uh, on room air, their saturation is less than 94, they have evidence of increased work of breathing or increased re respiratory rate, chest x showing more than 50% of lobe infiltration, and the PF and SF ratio accordingly uh, low and uh, hemodynamic instability. 
So as I said before, it is not just to give oxygen or to tell that how much oxygen we are giving. Also, it is important for these patients to categorize, to understand at which point we are going to accelerate our treatment strategy. So we'll take simple common oxygen delivery system that is the low flow oxygen delivery devices where we have face masks, venturi masks, uh, non breathable uh, masks. So remember, we all know that aerosolization is an issue when it comes to uh, ventilation in our COVID patients and the healthcare workers' um, uh, exposure to uh, the virus. But however, when it comes to low flow oxygen devices, the uh, aerosolization is negligible. So we have, don't have to worry when, when we see those patients. However, still we have to persist or maintain the infection prevention control all measures. So whenever we have less than 94, we, we have to make a target value. That is the target value of those patients who are not COPD as 92 to 96. So we use certain devices like a nasal cannula, but remember we the maximum flow in each device is limited. So if we understand the patient requires more uh, oxygen to achieve the target level, and we must not, and as an example, you put a um, uh, simple face mask and you just uh, open up thinking, oh, I want to give 10 liters of oxygen, the patient will not get 10 liters. It's the rest of the oxygen is wasted. So in this situation, we need to understand as all the uh, health caregivers, each device has a limited or cut uh, cap oxygen delivery. We heard from the previous speaker about the prone positioning, uh, especially those um, moderate ill patients. So uh, the, the, the prone positioning is well documented exactly. in those intubated and ventilated patients with ARDS with studies and they have shown that recruitability and uh, uh, oxygenation of those uh, patients uh, uh, for, for those ECVL ill patients. However, there are a few couple of studies have shown that even moderate, uh, mild to moderate or moderate illness patients who needed oxygen will do well with self-proning and it will improve the VQ mismatch, their oxygenation, also they will reduce the work of breathing. So this can be coupled with your high flow nasal oxygen or CPAP or NIV device. And but however, we need to understand these patients need to be independent they need to be well we need to well communicate with the patients and we need the cooperation. Remember, when we are doing the self proning for these patients, if they are not cooperating and if they all those devices are, are not uh, properly connected, so we may just uh, get into more problem by self proning. And there are there are some studies have shown that uh, the proning has caused in those especially patients with on CPAP has caused de uh, delay in the intubation and ventilation going into um, uh, uh, complications. So the high flu nasal oxygen therapy is something which is uh, which has been spoken quite widely nowadays. However, it's not something new, uh, but the studies which has showed in uh, severe COVID-19 pneumonic patients, especially in the re resource constrained settings where you are not going for invasive ventilation and all. So it has given a lot of um, uh, positive uh, feedback, especially those patients with uh, hypoxic respiratory failure. And it is said that almost half of those have received successfully been without need for mechanical ventilation. Remember, Putting a patient on high flow nasal oxygen does not mean that patient is getting the right oxygenation because why? It is important for them to monitor according to the ROC score, that is the oxygen saturation and FiO2 respiratory rate to decide the chance of patient going to uh, HFNO failure. So uh, failure and ending up with intubation. So these studies have shown two hours and six hours and also 12 hours. But however, as a standard, you can use that six hours uh, by getting the score if it is less than 4.8. So what happens in high flow nasal oxygen? Because we all know that it is not just the 
pressure or the oxygen it is also Im improve the, the it's not only improving the oxygenation and the reducing carbon dioxide also it decreases the work of breathing so um, all the additional humidification factor also reducing the microaculacrasis so this is a very good uh, device which is important in a hdu icu setup to for the treatment of severe severe covid pneumonia however the, the higher risk of this viral contamination through aerosolization is something really worrying in these patients. So you need that uh, defined HDIs you set up uh, and uh, you have to use all the uh, infectious prevention control measures, same as when you use uh, NIV. So uh, one thing is you can advise the patient to wear a mask on top of the uh, high flow nasal um, uh, cannula and they ask them to breathe uh, through the closed mouth. And uh, the thing is, when uh, to save the oxygen, the one strategy, and also to improve the outcome of uh, the high flow nasal oxygen, you can use intermittently depending on the patient's requirement. So it's always a question uh, the hospital capacity of oxygen supply. And because the, if you calculate, it may end up uh, uh, consuming a lot of oxygen. And especially when you are having multiple units being used, um, uni units uh, used high flow simultaneously. So it's very important to calculate the required oxygen um, capacity uh, 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 volume for those patients before just putting them up. So when you start, you start with a 30 liter per minute and then you can up, go up to 60 liter per minute. And uh, um, it's always just better to check half an hour to one hour whether you can achieve the main target saturation. So when you use the uh, nasal catheter, it has to be less than 50%. And also reassessment again in two hours to see whether the patient is having any clinical response and your target saturation has achieved, like if it is not mm -hmm. more than 92, at least more than 90. So uh, we, but the biggest problem we uh, come across is that uh, placing the mask and uh, starting the high flow of these uh, patients and uh, the, the, because initially there's good response and they, then uh, the healthcare worker or the doctor feel that, okay, patient is feeling better. We have achieved this target saturation and the patient will go unknown. Um, uh, the monitoring get delayed and the patient becomes, uh, uh, end up with intubation and ventilation. However, when you uh, put them uh, uh, high flow, there is a way of putting it that the first connect the nasal calibre of the patient, then placing the mask, then subsequent to the putting up the oxygen. When you remove it, you have to go take it the same way in the reverse process. So uh, as I said before, when you say about oxygen delivery, ventilation is also comes into play. So this is non-invasive ventilation. Uh, it has been um, uh, widely studied now in the recent past on, for this COVID, severe COVID patients. And uh, in the, this study, they showed that more than half of these patients and uh, survived without intubation. So it's a wonderful uh, um, support strategy for uh, oxygenation in these patients. So, and especially, and uh, it's a, um, a viable strategy when you have overcrowded and limited inter, uh, intensive care resources. I'm sure uh, in, uh, uh, our setup also uh, nicely fitting into this, uh, requiring more and more in IV if we need more, uh, if we see come across more severe uh, COVID pneumonia patients. And, uh, but the thing is, it is quite important to understand to uh, uh, early to pick up when these patients go into NIV failure. So we all know that there are two modes we use that commonly in the hypoxic respiratory failure patients, we use the CPAP mode and uh, bi-level mode because some of these patients are having chronic respiratory disease like COPD and so on. So they, when they develop hypercapnic respiratory failure, we must not go on uh, CPAP uh, mode, we have to change into bi-level mode. So what is uh, the NIV? We all know that it's a double Newman and non-vented mask, non-vented full face mask we have to use. So there are some centers in uh, Europe, they have been used these helmet uh, masks. So uh, if, if you don't have a closed system, then of course a single tube in with non-vented mask with an exhalation port and a wider filter is used. I'll show you next uh, slide how it is fitted. 
And uh, viral filter is quite important. Why? Because the circuit between the mask and the exhalation port is kept because to minimize or to uh, negate the um, aerosolization. And when we start, we all have to always start with a minimum pressure. So with the C in a CPAP, we start with a maybe about seven uh, centimeter uh, water or can go up to 10. But the, whenever we see the pressure requirement goes up or the oxygen is going uh, up and then the work of breathing is not settling down, we have to anticipate the um, CPAP failure. So uh, if you are using, if the patient is responding well, and we may have to change the viral filter every 24 hours by checking the wetness of the viral filter. So this is how we basically uh, fit the uh, uh, non mented full face mask uh, and using the exhalation port. It's very important to understand the importance of exhalation port and uh, fitting in the right direction. Otherwise we will end up uh, early CPAP failure. And also uh, we may say patient is not getting better, blood gas are getting bad. So uh, the, the also it is, have to always keep ourselves in, uh, uh, we all must remember that CPAP or high flow uh, nasal oxygen should not delay intubation whenever there is necessary. So always there's a debate, what is good, high flow or in IV patients, uh, and so, sometimes somebody can say that high flow nasal oxygen has um, consumed a lot of oxygen. We'll be having problems with the oxygen supply and CPAP when we use it is less. However, the um, uh, these patients are in the ICU or in the HDU isolation. The minimum contact with the outsiders, so they are frustrated and they are anxious. And with the anxiousness and itself, their, their work of breathing goes up. So if you have a, a device which is just fitted into the nose and they are more comfortable, they can have their meal, they can communicate easily. So uh, sometime uh, a CPAP machine or an NIV uh, device on the face, full face or you know mask, tightly fitted, it can be claustrophobic and patient will struggle and more and more work of breathing with whole patient can uh, end up with. Uh, in IV failure. So the, when it comes for mechanical ventilation, so invasive mechanical ventilation uh, thought to be at one point, um, the, it is the, you know, everyone initially who was put on in, 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 uh, mechanical ventilation, they thought it's the, the dead end kind of, but now they have shown that the, you can um, uh, get good results by uh, selecting the right patients at, and uh, uh, introducing mechanical ventilation earlier. So the younger, the, the, these studies have showed the younger and healthier people have good recovery despite severe disease in certain cases. But having, uh, having said that, the uh, intervention, right intervention at the right time is the most important thing. And uh, uh, late intubation and ventilation will cause high increased mortality. So this is something again, we have come across many a times uh, uh, because uh, we were very lucky uh, to have a good support and at Mullaria Hospital where the physicians have been very, really great uh, uh, and the anesthetists and we have come across many patients with refractory hypoxemia. So one of the questions is they always push, put uh, forward was what is the option of giving, giving ECMO? Uh, remember, ECMO is not something where it is uh, as a last resort for refractory hypoxemia, because why uh, even the highly specialized centers, uh, they are uh, the, the uh, ECMO life support um, or register, organizing registry has suggested that their uh, mortality is quite high. So, but now the we know, we know um, ECMO used in those patients uh, and they are having a stringent criteria and they have shown a good results in the recent past. So what we need is a stringent criteria to decide to uh, for this refractory hypoxemia to offer ECMO. And uh, we have to understand it's not just the you know uh, one-off thing, but uh, remember it, it is just the staffing and the resource intensive uh, uh, setup is quite uh, high. So at the end, I just want to tell that 
supplementation of oxygen is not the only answer for progressive desaturation because there are so many factors can come into play during the disease process for hypoxemia. So it is important to understand at each and every point what is the cause of this hypoxemia to attend. Example, is it this the viremia process or is it this cytokine storm or is it the secondary or bacterial or fungal infection or we are seeing more and more uh, microthrombin uh, embolism or uh, pulmonary embolism and uh, also organizing pneumonia. So it is important for us to understand my patient, like we heard from the previous speakers, there is a, a vast spread of heterogeneity. So it is very difficult to pinpoint and say, oh, this patient is hypoxemic, getting oxygen requirement is going up and this could be for this. So it is very important to uh, categorize these patients to intervene, not only just giving oxygen, also to attend that particular uh, event. So I want to thank the College of Anesthesiologists and the College of Pulmonologists. They have come out with this document. It's a very handy uh, uh, guide. You, everybody can have it. I think in the future, we will all, um, uh, like uh, Madam said uh, at the outset, uh, most of the uh, doctors should be prepared like uh, at which point I'm going to give oxygen, how I'm going to give oxygen, and uh, what are the devices I'm going to use and uh, to minimize the waste stage. So just to summarize, we heard from the previous speakers and uh, this is the ERS guideline. And at which point we, give, we don't give oxygen, at which point we give supplement oxygen, at which point we give NIV. Of course, it is very easy to put like in a piece of paper like, uh, or a, on a slide like this, but when it comes to actual cases, it is very challenging. Despite your supportive care, anticoagulation and corticosteroids, still we, are, uh, we may struggle uh, to keep up the oxygenation. So if anybody is interested, and there's a guideline developed by the College of Pulmonologists and awaiting the third edition also with the new thing. Thank you. Uh, I'm so glad that we could have this uh, because that there are more than 600 uh, uh, participants uh, in attendance uh, and listening to this program and it well keeps with the theme of the year, the professional excellence towards holistic care, indicating that the need for multidisciplinary approach for management of these patients. So there are many questions that uh, I think that it's important that uh, we, because the part, the, the range of doctors that who have joined are in a sort of a, from the lower, the medical officers to their specialists, we try to answer each and every question of uh, these uh, uh, doctors who have joined. One is that there is remdesivir available in Sri Lanka. I, I think that uh, one of you have to maybe that one? No, you have to go and answer there, Hasha. Yeah, remdesivir is not available in Sri Lanka and it is not in our local guideline also. And uh, as uh, Ananda said, and as I said in my talk, uh, WHO has uh, con is given a conditional recommendation against its use based on their solidarity trial results, which showed that it didn't uh, give any uh, mortality benefit and uh, it didn't uh, shorten the survival of, uh, uh, rather shorten the duration of hospital stay as well. So it's very expensive, about 50,000 rupees for a five-day uh, five course. I think uh, uh, it will not be available if, even if we wanted it, because even in India, it's, it's quite scarce. Uh, the other, uh, maybe that you could yes, remain yes. there. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I said, I think I, I refer to that. In, in the US, uh, 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 boricidinib uh, in a dose of in two to four milligrams, I think, when added to remdesivir, it was shown in a small trial uh, to be beneficial. So uh, I think it is licensed for emergency use there, but it's, uh, I, I, as far as I know, NICE guidelines does not uh, refer to that. Uh, very costly as well. Again, boricidinib, I can't quite remember, but 
I think a course yeah, will be thousands of rupees. So it's it's a, one single tablet, yeah. So yes. quite quite expensive. Yes, maybe in India, yes. Right. Uh, the next question is to Akla actually. Uh, is there a place for dexamethasone or methylprednisolone for COVID patients who are known asthmatics with cough and wheezing who are not on any respiratory support? So basically, it's not uh, uncommon to see uh, COVID patients, uh, moderate to severe illness patients coming with the exacerbation of asthma, I'm sure the sir will uh, agree with me. So in those cases, if the patient is not having any evidence of um, uh, hypoxemia, if we, if we can't explain by uh, COVID pneumonia. And uh, if it is uh, just the exacerbation of asthma and they can have uh, 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 COVID uh, PCR positive or something, we have to treat them as exacerbation of asthma. And, uh, but if the patient has COVID pneumonia and exacerbation of uh, bronchospasms going on, then of course, it's a question uh, of uh, giving dexamethasone or uh, prednisolone. So we know that the giving dexamethasone, we have, there's a way of calculating and uh, the requirement of prednisolone. We know that we give 40 milligram uh, uh, dose and that can be converted to dexamethasone. And in that case, there is no um, uh, difference using whatever the agent. Yeah, could you all repeat that dose of dexamethasone also that when you when it is indicated that when you give the dexamethasone, but the, the for patients that the, the yeah six milligram is equal to four forty milligram uh, daily for ten days. Yeah, so the, for COVID pneumonia we give for daily for ten days. Yes, for but days. Uh, we are talking about the exacerbation so of this asthma. Is the next question. Ah, sorry. <laughs> this is for thing. patients. That when it is indicated, dexamethasone, yeah. the dose and the duration and the route. Yeah, pay, uh, for the so the steroid dexamethasone uh, IV or oral six milligrams daily for ten days, which is equivalent to prednisolone forty milligrams, uh, methylprednisolone oral thirty two milligrams, and IV hydrocortisone fifty, uh, 50 milligrams eight hourly. So those can be uh, substituted. And then. of harsh i think yeah. uh, uh, the question of dexamethasone whether one dose fits all uh, is a question uh, sometimes uh, there are instances where we have to escalate the dexamethasone and in instances there are where there are patients who have tried methylprednisolone 250 milligrams a dose uh, and this uh, scenario where this organizing pneumonia or acute fibrinous organizing pneumonia comes into play what is dexamethasone 6 milligrams daily iv or oral is it one size fits all or is there room for uh, escalation of the dexamethasone or shifting to methylprednisolone in certain groups of patients, in certain clinical scenarios? Yes, uh, probably there may be a place in certain cases, but I think uh, uh, no guideline uh, in any country has sort of uh, uh, advocated the use of uh, methylprednisolone pulse therapy anywhere, but I think it's used in some of the US hospitals. In UK, I'm not sure whether, whether it's being used. They, they still tend to uh, stick to the dexamethasone IV dose. And that is also, uh, I, I mean, like say, so what you're referring to is pulsing of uh, with the We have multiple clinical experiences in patients here in Sri Lanka, both in the state sector and malaria, sometimes one over in And then uh, we have managed now, we have found to manage patients in private settings. So there are instances where we can. I do agree. I think the, the another uh, issue would be whether to sort of now say in, in case you need more anti-inflammatory therapy, whether it's appropriate to start give methylprednisolone pulse or whether it is okay, whether it is uh, better on, based on some trial evidence to add tocilizumab. So that uh, as, as you say, populations, yeah. Now with uh, the dexamethasone standard of care, uh, 
Tosi is uh, even along with this, as with the as in the rent rent cap. Yes. Uh, those studies, the results have become more favorable when it's uh, when it's given with Tosi's uh, when it's Tosi's when it's given with Exa. That's right. So yeah. Think, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I think uh, in, in our setting, probably what we need to stress is that uh, every patient who becomes hypoxic uh, below uh, 94% on room air has to have dexamethasone IV because I, I feel that that is something that we have to stress on because that's the starting point. And then in selected cases, we could probably add consider methylprednisolone and tocilizumab. Yes, I, I don't think even the world is in agreement on that. So there, there is there, there are issues. So probably we, we need to select. Uh, what do you think, so Anand? Yeah. He, he said that uh, hypoxemia, treating hypoxemia is not. Uh, there are so many scenarios. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
fourth, fifth day, like they, they probably will start feeling more fatigue and then they will have exertion and this there. So that's that's why we, we have to pick those up. And especially if we do institute a home monitoring system for some of the patients, we will have to be very clear and advise and probably have medical teams ready with pulse oximeters to visit those houses and then see whether the patients are getting uh, desaturated or not. Should uh, the normal doctors have the pulse oximeters in our practices? Yes, I, I, think, uh, I think probably if we do go in for a home monitoring system, that will be essential. I think uh, I think to elaborate on that, I agree fully agree with that. And I think the, that your question is very important because that's the category we have to identify early. And I believe if we identify early, I'm sure you will agree with me that if we identify early the, this category and uh, we can sort of most of the patients will recover with the appropriate uh, treatment. And so measuring uh, pulse oximetry is very important. I mean, if we are to keep these patients in the community at home, at least even the selected cases, we have to have some method of uh, measuring their uh, either objectively and uh, subjectively both uh, their the, the breathing efforts and the, the hypoxia. That's very important. And uh, the, the other question whether we have seen any difference? No, it's, it's very difficult. We have seen uh, patients of uh, sort of more or less same comorbidity similar things uh, some dying some recovering so it's very difficult to say uh, it's probably that the individual responses to this varies on the other hand among young patients one thing we have seen is that there are two clear things which we have seen as uh, bad prognostic things in addition to comorbidities probably these are more important than comorbidities one thing is the obesity the obese young patients, the, the people who have died, I, I believe, uh, I don't know about the, exactly everybody, but uh, we have seen that that's uh, one of the bad prognostic thing. The second thing is the smoking. Uh, that's the, that's the, the, probably the most uh, the important factors for poor prognosis. Diabetes and, yeah, yeah, diabetes and hypertension matters, and uh, but probably more than that, when you take comorbidities, I my experience in my ex limited experience, it is the CKD, which uh, affects the uh, which are the worst thing. Of course, the diabetics and this thing fare they fare poorly, but uh, not everybody. More than that, the CKD is I think is a problem. Yeah, in your experience, this therapy for prophylactic aspirin or not? If you could continue to answer. Uh, Madam, uh, the, in our guideline, what we recommended was, even though there is no no clinical evidence based on the the expert opinion, what was recommended was to give uh, aspirin to people who have comorbidities who are diagnosed as having COVID, uh, in spite of their symptomatology, even when they are mildly symptomatic or in asymptomatic, to recommend aspirin for people who have comorbidities like diabetes, uh, hypertension, and so. On. And there's another, whether we should treat the COVID positive patients who are at centers or home with uh, vitamin D1000 and zinc containing vitamins? Uh, no, at the moment, there's no evidence supporting uh, prophylactic or therapeutic uh, effect of vitamin D, D3 treatment. Um, I believe Manigla is planning to do a study yes, on uh, this. There were studies to show that people who are deficient less than 20 nanograms per uh, uh, deciliter. Even in India, they are saying that the vast number of uh, deaths is due to partly associated with low vitamin D levels. So if you give high dose vitamin D for those who are deficient, uh, there is a uh, beneficial effect. It's just a general increased immunity. We know that vitamin D affects the immunity and low D3 levels will have a worse immunity. So that actually we have asked for the ethical clearance which is pending, we can start that study uh, to So there's no, I mean, so far there's no, no evidence, evidence for us to use yes. vitamin D at yeah. all. No. Just to add I don't to think that, that uh, we need to be very careful in recommending yes. all yes. There is no thing. evidence at the moment. Yes, there's so we no have evidence to prove at the it, moment. Uh, yes. And yeah. yeah, just to add to that, I think there's this controversy about vitamin D and immune deficiency. It is said that uh, diabetic patients and obese patients are anyway vitamin D deficient. So when the studies were done, uh, something that actually some of the studies there, there were some studies showed adverse outcomes, but that may have been due to their diabetes or obesity more than the actual vitamin D level that which may have been a, an innocent bystander. So it's actually the other comorbidities which are important. Yeah, question. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with uh, Manil of that uh, particular video 
it was uh, uh, i think done by a um, chess physician from south africa and uh, he had performed a series of uh, bronchoscopies and he has found this fi uh, fibrinous exudates and when he cleared up uh, the oxygenation was in, uh, improving of those patients yes i agree so what happens if you take the uh, the uh, pathophysiology or process of in the severe covid pneumonia there are some we still we don't know which group of patients they will develop this acute fibrinous organizing pneumonia so th there are patient group of patients they develop this fibrinous in the alveolar ducts as well as the terminal bronchioles so if you kill clear that obviously the uh, uh, dead space you can clear and also you can improve the oxygenation however this thought was there even in, uh, in the first wave in italy so the some of the uh, chest physicians they went ahead with the bronchoscopy and they did not find any substantial evidence to say that is increased the, or improved their oxygenation and survival what happened uh, most of the chest physician died <laughs> so, yeah, um, right here yeah. uh, another uh, question is that a vt prophylaxis is it given only to hypoxic patients or is it to all hospitalized patients well uh, the the local guideline here uh, what uh, it is what is said there is that it's given when patients turn hypoxic i mean hospitalized patients maybe towards the latter part of their illness when they when they are more symptomatic and when there's impending hypoxemia we could give that but not to hospitalized patients in the initial stages uh, yes, yes. If I may add to that, uh, I think when you look at uh, guidelines from some countries, it is recommended for hospitalized patients. The reason is they admit only hypoxic patients. So all of them require that. I mean, our case it is different. So actually, the, uh, it is for hypoxic patients. Another question is that at this, I don't know. For healthcare workers who receive two doses of vaccination, maybe after even after three weeks, do they need to be quarantined once exposed to COVID patients? There's, there should be exposure. All have to be wearing all healthcare workers have to be wearing masks. Yeah. Uh, in even in uh, uh, other occasions, yeah. Uh, actually, masks. yeah. So the vaccine after the second dose of the vaccine, uh, it is said that after two weeks after the second dose of the vaccine, the person is said to be. I mean, the the maximum effect of the vaccine is there, but then the vaccine is mainly to prevent severe disease and death. So there can be transmission. There can be a low level of transmission. There can be replication in the throat. So no, I think there is no data anywhere in the world where a study has shown that transmission has been blocked. It has been published as uh, hasn't been published at least. So there is a possibility of having the virus in the throat and transmitting it. So we we actually have, uh, advise all all uh, health precautions to be taken even after vaccination. Uh, what is your advice for prophylactic uh, steam inhalation? Is it more harmful? May not be, no? Harmful or harmless? Yeah, probably. I mean, yeah, if there is, yeah, probably if there is a nasal blockage, I think there, there may be some relief of symptom. Yeah. But uh, once I think Professor Mani Piri said that if you want to kill uh, virus through steam inhalation, then you will have to kill the cells first in the throat and in the nasal passage. So there, there is no, no point in doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is uh, around the, yes. uh, I think, madam, if you ask, say, prophylactic stimulation, I, I would say there's no place. No because place. prophylactic means we try to prevent the infection. Yes. It may have a sort of soothing effect and as I said, to clear the blocked nose and so on. But it will not prevent the, the viral infection. Yeah, but, uh, around, uh, what is our death rate of ventilated patients? Uh, yeah, probably. More, more, yeah, I think it's more than 70%. More than 70%. No, sorry, I don't know whether this is a really a fair question or uh, a very unusual situation. Uh, I know that all the complications are uh, not all that common or perhaps pretty rare in children. But I'm a little concerned because now the uh, occurrence seems to be increasing in children. But in children, uh, Dr. Afla, mostly, that uh, we will have major problems with supplemental oxygen because it's not easy to to uh, to give oxygen to children at the best of times um, so you sometimes may have to make the decision between non invasive ventilation and invasive ventilation because it might be a little bit more convenient therapeutically to give 
um, uh, kind of invasive intellection. And also, I don't know whether I'm right in this because children seem to tolerate invasive ventilation a little bit better than the adults. So what are your thoughts on this? Because I know this is a difficult one, but uh, yeah, this okay. might be worth uh, talking about. Yeah, first of all, I don't have much experience in pediatric population. So however, the, uh, in, uh, the, the invent of high flow nasal oxygen and has done wonders in the pediatric population. So in that context, what I believe is, yes, may not be the CPAP or in IV, if you are not responding, that if you take the ROX index and if the high flow nasal oxygen is not responding, you may, may not go ahead with the CPAP and all that. We may have to straight away go to the mechanism. Yeah, I think Thank you. Hafla, is there a separate feeding for SPO2 for pregnant? Yes, uh, some of the guidelines came up with the separate uh, SPO2 uh, standard. They say they came up with uh, initially the WHO came with 93 for the norm, normal population initially, and uh, according to the WHO, it is 95 now. Uh, when would you decide on ECMO? Yes, so this is what I uh, discussed in my last slide. In fact, um, I'm sure the uh, ECMO center in Gaul, uh, we heard quite a few times how they are being forced and they have been uh, uh, pushed to give ECMO. So the, uh, the information we got and through my friends who are working in UK and uh, also uh, Amitha Sir's trainee who is uh, in uh, one of the training centers there, they, are the, they have a stringent criteria to select patients. As an example, in London St. Thomas's uh, Hospital, when they decide for anybody for ECMO, they should not be on vent, uh, uh, before the ventilation, not for more than five days of CPAP. So that kind of that stringent criteria has been put forward for those patients. And there are um, uh, other um, parameters also taken into consideration. Uh, so, uh, so not that uh, you put the, keep the patient on CPAP for 10 days, mechanically ventilate for two, three days, then you push for ECMO. So I think in a limited resource setting, we, we have only two machines, probably only one machine is running. I think uh, going with the, the last, as a last resort, as an ECMO for those patients is, I think it's, it, I, I, I don't personally, I cannot justify. So you have anything? Could you tell just a simple antibiotic for a productive cough with COVID? What would be the simple antibiotic that you would prescribe for productive cough? In a I think probably we don't use antibiotics uh, routinely like that unless there is a bacterial infection. So for prophylactically, there is no use for use, uh, no place for use of uh, antibiotics as far as I know. Yeah, I think yeah. that, yes, sir. Yeah, I, I think at the beginning, we don't use antibiotics. We should not use antibiotics because sometimes they can, if the things get prolonged, they can end up with uh, multi-drug resistant uh, organisms infecting, causing pneumonia. Uh, if it persists for more than... Uh, five, six days, then probably we'll have to consider starting antibiotics. Again, the, the common, uh, it, initially it would be due to community acquired organisms, so amoxicillin, co-amoxicillin sort of thing would be good enough, I, uh, I believe. Yeah, uh, I think uh, always, especially when the patient is uh, presented or when you have the uh, patient is having symptoms, like Madam said about uh, productive cough, and uh, you patient is having um, PCR positive in that case. So always they ought to have a worry that uh, this secondary uh, infection will hit on this patient and can get worse. So always that, that question is running in the back of the mind of a clinician. So that's why he tend to, or that clinician tend to uh, give antibiotic. But in that case, still, since we don't have clear evidence to say there is a secondary bacterial infection, we must not go um, and, and, and administer antibiotic, if at all, maybe stick to coamaxiclav or something very simple. intermediate care center or a hospital, what would indicate that you are short of oxygen? Very 
question. Uh, I, I think it is, uh, it is very important. It's a very important question. I think I, in one of my slides, I put that. I, I will share it with you. I think it is, uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, I'll send you the slide. But I think in a, in a nutshell, I think if somebody feels this short of breath when walking, doing from bed to going to the washroom, or, or when you are talking for a long, for, for some time when you're having a telephone conversation, if you feel short of breath, or if your friend, the other side of the phone asks whether you are dyspneic, then you have to consider whether you are uh, becoming hypoxic. It, it does not really mean that he is hypoxic, but then that is where you, you become suspicious. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. And also, if you are not feel, if you cannot get out of the bed, uh, if you feel very weak, those are maybe also indicating that the disease is getting worse. Uh, I think that uh, we have had uh, an excellent, uh, um, so much informative, uh, most timely uh, webinar um, on uh, COVID-19 hospital management essentials. There were more than 600 uh, to join online for this program. And I'm so thankful for our excellent three speakers, Dr. Harsha Satish Chandra, who is the president of the Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine, Dr. Ananda Vijayvikrama uh, from National Infectious Disease Hospital, and Dr. Akhila Sadikin, consultant chest physician from National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Uh, I think that we were able to clear many doubts and it was a very useful program. And we from SLMA trying to, will be trying to upload, I mean, uh, once it's edited, will be up, uh, uploaded uh, to the YouTube as early as possible for the benefit of uh, all the doctors as well as the community at large. So uh, let me conclude this webinar by thanking all three speakers again and also to all who are here in person as well as who joined online. Thank you very much for your patient attention.